Hey there, it's time once again for the Meaningful Measurable Marketing Podcast. I'm Jen Carroll. And I'm Annalisa Hilliard. Together, we are the Dames of Data Dames Marketing. As the Dames, Jen and I are marketing strategy consultants who help our clients align marketing, business goals, and measure results that matter. As longtime friends, we avidly consume and critique all kinds of drinks, spend as much time outdoors as possible, and are always learning. We also strive to stay on top of what's happening in our industry. Our goal with this podcast is to look at today's biggest marketing trends, many requiring enterprise-level teams and budgets to fully implement, and try to apply them in ways that make sense for small to mid-sized businesses. We hope you'll subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. You can connect with Jen and me via our website, datadamesmarketing.com, or on LinkedIn, where we do most of our social media networking. When Annalisa and I recorded this episode with Ebony Bond in May, she had recently left her position as an entrepreneurial fellow at the University of Akron Research Foundation. A graduate of the university's mechanical engineering program, Ebony recognized her love of creative problem solving and decided to take some time off to decide her next career move. Ebony describes herself as a curious creator, champion of fairness, and an authentic relationship builder. She's also exceptionally good at the customer discovery process, which was a major part of her role at the Research Foundation. From the first time Annalisa and I spoke with Ebony about a new idea of ours, we knew we had to have her on our podcast. Here's our interview. So good morning, Ebony. Um, Good morning. Hey, it's good to hear from you. Thanks for joining us on the Meaningful, Measurable Marketing Podcast. (laughs) It's such a mouthful. (laughs) What a mouthful. Um, uh, Today, we're going to be talking with you about all of your knowledge and experience in the customer discovery process. And it's really cool that we, uh, Annalisa and I actually had that opportunity to meet you because of the customer discovery process and mm-hmm. um, really enjoyed learning some things mm-hmm. from you. I mean, we're, I mean, obviously we're, we're longtime marketers, but we're always learning and mm-hmm. uh, you, you really had a lot to yeah. offer. So we're, we're really grateful Thank to you. have you. Yeah. We're really grateful to have you on the podcast today. So tell our listeners about you. What do you, what do you want them know. to know? <laughs> so this is, this is always an interesting story. Cause I'm like, let me give you my memoir really quickly. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, about me. So I'm from Mansfield, Ohio. Uh, okay. So the South of Northeast Ohio, mm-hmm. if you will. I'm familiar. Um, okay. So I, I, went to a school system was really interesting. I went to a school system that is was 610 out of 612 in the public school system in the state of Ohio at the time, like in an academic state of emergency, the, like the school oh, district dear. was telling us, like I was like, blew my mind when I learned that. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's like crazy. Um, but then I came, you know, to the University of Akron. I was studying uh, well, I came here and I was studying electrical engineering at first and it was like super boring and tedious. And I was like, this is not what I thought it was. I thought it was going to be like innovating some stuff and creating some stuff, not doing these long ass math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh my God. I do. I know what, I mean, even that you, that you attempted to do that blows my <laughs> mind because I, I yeah. would, Oh, wow. Yeah. Because only because yeah. only because I would think it would be incredibly boring, too. So I'm it was so it was like I'm like, this is like not this is not what I thought it was going to be. And, and it was that I wasn't like knocking those classes out of the park. I was, but it was just boring. And then I switched to be a biology major because I was like, you know what? I'll be a pediatrician and I'll give the kids hope <laughs> because hope is such a critical part of healing. And like, we need hope. And, then, and how old were you at that point? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't even maybe twenty two mm-hmm. or something like that. Twenty one, twenty two. Oh, uh, that's a great then, age for yeah, hope. Uh, hope. We've got it, to have hope. It was a great age. I found out for you know ended up poverty for me. But um, so mm. after a year and a half of being a biology major, I was like, who am I kidding? I hate school and I don't want to be a doctor. <laughs> 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 yeah, so. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah. I dropped out, and I found out poverty wasn't for me. So fortunately, I was a, <laughs> I was called to come back to school. Awesome. And I, I finished mechanical engineering, but I like had no desire to use that. Um, so fortunately, mm. I was able to work for an accelerator and an incubator. They kind of like shared me at the same time, helping early stage entrepreneurs and innovators, which is like the thing. The it was like the reason I r- originally went into engineering.
married 10 years before that, which was like crazy. I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, I did a mirror on innovation. And like, mm-hmm. and that's what I've been, this is what mm-hmm. I've been waiting for. <laughs> yes, it, yes. But it's 10 years and thousands of dollars of debt yeah. later. Uh, but yeah. um, that's, a, that's a little bit about, about, about me in a, in a nutshell. I'm just, I love independent thinking and innovation and like new stuff and novelty and just like discovery. I love curious, like beyond probably what people, you know, can handle. <laughs> and so, no, yeah. you totally spoke to us right away, yeah. man. We're like, that's, that's how we are. And so this is a perfect segue into one of our regular segments, which is what are you learning or what's bringing your joy? What's bringing you joy? So what are you learning right now or feeling good about? Yeah. So I had to think about this question, which is mm. like weird, which I, I hate that. <laughs> I, know, I hate right? that I had to think about it. Cause I'm like, something should be like very clearly, like I should be enjoying it. Um, <laughs> right. But, like, what am I doing with my life? Oh, I didn't um, mean for it to be that deep. That's awesome. No, no that's, <laughs> that's just how it is. I'm a processor, so me too. People, one of my friends used to say, "You are so fake deep, Ebony," and I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know." Oh. Low blow, low blow. Um, <laughs> like decided, you know, to stop working in in February, so I resigned to try to like figure out how to unbox myself. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm I'm doing all these things, and my whole life has been about the next step that I should do. Like, this is what you should do. This is like what mm. humans like should do, and I'm just like, what the freak am like what? how did I get here and I don't want to be here mm. I want to like build something for me and try to figure out what that is and so mm-hmm. um I resigned in February to unbox myself and try to really discover like who I am outside of like trying to act professional mm-hmm. and so the thing I'm like really enjoying right now is like really unveiling my authentic self and like having the space to do that without like any like external influence or any influences from like some like a power authority whether it's like this it has nothing to do with them but just you know them being there um kind of influences you know how you show up and so that's the thing that I'm learning how to do and that like I'm enjoying like even like this morning I woke up and I just like go and dance or, and sing around my neighborhood like it's a freaking blast awesome. so, <laughs> I wish I we, we need to move no, yeah. we're, like nobody's doing that yes. here yeah. yes and like um, go out and be like with the sun I'm like hi sun <laughs> um, so that's the thing that like I'm like learning mm-hmm. and enjoy- it's been a process of like really taking those kind of like layers off and you know mm-hmm. trying to figure out like what's really naturally there kudos for that I've feel like especially that's like super far from engineering or at least what we know is engineering right because it's like very boundary driven I feel like exactly like (laughs) one of my like classes um that I was even speaking about on LinkedIn it was called control systems design and like (laughs) The Ooh. like one of the things is that every system has its inputs and then you have the system that the inputs go through and then you have your outputs. The whole thing about a system is you get to define the boundaries of what the system is and so how you like control it. And so I'm just kind of like redefining what those boundaries are for me. And I think what uh, what you're learning actually meshes really well with a couple of things Annalisa and I are learning. As I shared with you before we started recording is uh, just finish Think Again by Adam Grant. And this book is to me just, yeah, it's got me thinking again, exactly what uh, exactly what the intent of, you know, Adam's intent was. And I can't even encapsulate everything that I, I want to process as a result of reading this book. But I'll just share this this little quote that I thought is a true gem. He said, it's when we progress from novice to amateur that we become overconfident. A bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. In too many domains of our lives, we never gain enough expertise to question our opinions or discover what we don't know. We have just enough information to feel self-assured about making pronouncements and passing judgment, failing to realize that we've climbed to the top of Mount Stupid without making it over to the other side. Yes. So I know, I love that. That was um, that was fairly early in the book and he, he was opining about how our society, of course, has become very polarized 
And that's because mm-hmm. oftentimes we never we never reach the, you know, we, we know a little bit of information um, and maybe it's even inaccurate information. And, yeah. we, and, and we're, we're sitting at the top of Mount Stupid making yeah. making judgment calls about other people. And we need to to have some humility. He talked about that, yeah. like confidence with humility basically mm-hmm. was where he said the ideal place to be is. So uh, mm-hmm. I've been thinking about think again. So and Lisa, and you, and you have a book about that's coming. So I would be thinking about think again, because we were actually at the Stark County library and I saw that book. Uh, it was a, like a <laughs> featured book table and uh-huh. I picked it up and like, as soon as I picked it up, Jen like snatched it out of my hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> Give me that book. <laughs> so Give me that book. <laughs> I'm not reading that book right now. <laughs> I'm going to pass it. I'm going to pass it over to her now that I'm done. <laughs> I know. But, but you picked up another yeah, book. No, so I'm reading um, How I Built This by mm-hmm. Guy Raz, which is a podcast, right? And yes. he turned it into like he did some highlights in, in a book. Really good, really good podcast, obviously. But the the book, the first part of it talks about two of the two female entrepreneurs, the one that started Zola, which is like a wedding planning. And site. also the name of your dog. Also the name of my dog. Yeah, so. <laughs> which which was not intentional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At um, all. And then the other one was uh, the founder of Stitch Fix just really resonate with their stories. Um, Went back and listened to those podcast episodes. Mm -hmm. Just definitely was kind of inspired on kind of where we're at with our entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. And what was the, I was just kind of curious when you said like really resonated, like what resonated? Like she started out in social media Mm -hmm. and just like, I think both of them kind of started out in like digital marketing, which is where actually i think maybe you're talking about we listened to a third one oh, with away the suitcase the suitcase <laughs> oh, yeah, company yeah, yeah, yeah. yep so there was a so there were three that he highlighted and then we listened to that one too and it was the founder of away and she started out in social media so go ahead yeah yeah just when it was like new and young and so like i mean she's obviously very smart but like she was the only like very few people were doing social media when she took on like social media management for people out in LA. I think she graduated mm. from Penn State even maybe went partway through Penn State. Yeah, I then... don't think she even graduated. And that was part of it, too. She was just always so intrepid. She was like, kind of I just her kind way. of well, like you talk about like unboxing. Yeah. Ebony, mm-hmm. you talk about yeah. that. She was very much. Oh, there has to be a way around right. this. Like, oh, I don't have marketing experience, but I want to do this. Well, there has to be a way around. Right. That was her. She was mm-hmm. always finding a way. And, well, mm-hmm. and then she found it a way, ironically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. And one of the things was like finding a partner in the business who had kind of complementary skills. And I really feel that's true. Mm. Like with Jen, like we each have our strengths and I feel like we together, we have a, a better skill set than separate. Definitely. So. I appreciate you. All right. Just a moment to say, I really appreciate you, Annalisa, so much. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She's truly an awesome business partner. So we want to talk today about customer discovery. How do you define that, Ebony, when you, when somebody says, oh, what, what is customer discovery? It sounds like an adventure. What, what is it actually? (laughs) Um, how I, you know, maybe would naturally describe it or define it as like really understanding your customers and like their problems so that you can solve them. Like people really like pay to have problems solved. So you really just need to understand more about your customers and what is motivating, what would motivate them to adopt a new solution or a new way. And that's really what customer discovery is. But I do have a book here. Mm. And I wanted to see like what the formal definition of it was. And it says customer discovery first captures the founder's vision and turns it into a series of business model hypotheses. Then it develops a plan to test customers' reactions to those hypotheses and turn them into facts. Um, And then another part of the book goes on to say that it's really so that you can understand the customer's perception of the problem, Mm -hmm. understand their need to solve it, and figure out is it important enough to get a significant number of people Mm -hmm. to, you know, want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that that's really the essence of customer discovery. Nothing more, nothing less. It's really just understanding customers' current processes and their problems. Mm. And you shared during your your mini memoir, (laughs) your work for the your work with the accelerator. So how did you how did you get to love customer discovery? I mean it sounds like it's totally 
your thing, new things, learning, but uh, yes. tell us about your experience. I remember when I, I like I had an internship and through the internship, got to volunteer and kind of, I guess, be an observer of a program called i through the National Science Foundation. Mm-hmm. And when I learned that these were like the foundation of building a business, like it, it demystified it for me in, in some ways and made it more attainable or like some like I could see myself mm-hmm. more in it. It wasn't like business was this big like contro, give me, give me, give me, take, take, take type thing. Yeah. Um it was like, oh my God. It's like the basis of it is empathy. Like if you do it well, mm-hmm. like it's because you started with empathy. And so for me I was like, oh my God, I love that. <laughs> oh, and you know and so, I love that too, actually. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, you know, was my like kind of like aha moment with it. And as far as like my actual experience, like a lot of it, like on the formal side through my job was more so like helping entrepreneurs kind of like frame their questions or dig out kind of like what their real hypotheses are about their business and why they would be successful or why they would fail. Aside from that, honestly, like even if we take it back five years, six years from even, you know, working in this space, I used to work for Time Warner Cable and their Mm. sales, inbound sales. People would be calling in like, hey, I need to set up cable. The process that they take you through is kind of like customer discovery. So you have to understand people, like how many people are in the home, Mm -hmm. how many devices do you have, like all these things. And it's really like you do the customer, do you really understand the customer and what they have going on? And then you truly just tailor the package to what they need. I'm not trying to oversell you or undersell you. I mean, I might try to add it. Phone line, you know <laughs> right? I mean? but, right. But other than that, like I really tried to design packages based on what they said. And I wasn't trying to like, mm-hmm. and so that was like also like kind of like an experience with what the customer discovery was even is and was in a sales role. That's definitely interesting. And I, I love how you said like empathy is, was kind of the aha because we th- I think we think about sales as like, oh, like I have this thing and I'm going to try to sell everybody on it, whether they need it or not, or whatever their, you know, whatever their situation is, do- you know, it doesn't matter. It's more about my yeah. product, you know, well, or my yeah. service. So. Don't you think our, I mean, maybe we can comment here. Don't you think our culture has kind of, I mean, I think there are, I mean, people who do that. That's literally how they, yep. they conduct their sales. Yeah, for sure. But then, yeah, not being able to see yourself in that, like I totally can can relate to that like Mm -hmm. oh I don't want to do business if that's what I have to you know I don't want to have a business if that's what I have to do that's so so for sure yeah for sure and I think another thing is like you have to keep in mind also like as a salesperson like it's okay if like what you have isn't a fit for the person and you have to keep that like it's not your job to manipulate the person so like you know what this isn't for you like it's okay yeah I love that well and and Elise and I talk even in our own business a lot of times about fit with uh, Mm. our clients and we, you know, we say no to people, you know, who essentially, you know, want to give us money for marketing because we know that it's not going to be a good fit and that's okay because it then frees us up to find somebody else that, you know, another company that we will be a better fit for. And I guess, I mean, I want to like make a comment about, you know, the dis- the customer discovery process in, in terms of marketing, um, where I think at least, and you can, you know, tell us what you think as well. I feel like it's so essential to messaging. I I feel like many people in marketing roles are like, okay, what are we going to put on social media? What am I going to post on LinkedIn today? What am I going to do on Instagram or what what web page am I going to write? And they give very little thought to the message that they want to communicate. And if you mm-hmm. don't know what job your customer wants to accomplish, if you don't know what challenges mm-hmm. they have in getting that job accomplished, the, there's a really good chance your messaging is going to be off, especially yeah. if your messaging is our brand is awesome. Here's what we have to give you. So for me as a marketer, I really think customer discovery is so critical in that in that messaging piece, just relating, yes. like relating to people and their needs. And like you said, if they should know when they come to your website or whatever, they should know if that's a, if if what they offer is a fit. I mean, generally yes. speaking. So yes. Anyway, what what about the entrepreneur? I mean, we can digress a little bit. What where where does customer discovery come in? You you kind of alluded to it with the entrepreneur journey. I think that it helps you build something for one people want, um, and like 
I think uh, people have to get out of their own way mm. oftentimes. So, like, it helps you in a sense that you can, like, eliminate a lot of time building the wrong thing, effort, money, resources, all of that, mm. self-esteem. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, so I think that it's, like, super key because oftentimes you have this vision about, like, why this is, like, the best thing. And then, like, for example, you might say, like, hey, we need to build this app because, like, people internally in our company, they are not communicating enough with each other. But if we just had this app where people mm. could, like, communicate, like, it would be, like, so great. And then you go and talk to people and then they're like, if I have another app I have to deal with, I'm going to go bang my head in the wall. <laughs> like, I don't <laughs> want an app. Like, what if it was just some email templates that were already, like, mm. constructed and I could just have them on deck to send out? And that would, like, make it easier for me to communicate because then I'll have to put in that extra work. It's already there. Mm-hmm. Like I can just send the email and you and you would spend all that time and money like building mm-hmm. in, an app or there was another, like a startup here in Northeast Ohio, they had these sensors and they were originally designing them for people who had amputated limbs. So they mm-hmm. could put these sensors with their prosthetics and say you went to grab a cup the sensor would realize you were making that like grabbing motion and then assist you with picking up the cup. Mm -hmm. But when they went and actually talked to people, they figured out that a lot of amputees just figure out how to navigate life without a prosthetic. And so like there wasn't Mm going to be enough. It it wasn't going to be a significant enough of people to, you know, make a profitable business out of it. But what they found was runners really care about their running form. So they could put that same sensor and that sensor in the in a shoe could give information about a runner's running form. And even if it shaved a second off of their running time, that second is so valuable to a wow. runner. And so they were able to, you know, pivot and now that's their their product. And so truly listening to your customers and not just thinking you have the best idea, but let your customers tell you like if uh, it's worthy. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's thinking again right there. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, does customer discovery have like buckets or like main aspects in the process? Like you should make sure that when you're embarking on customer discovery, you do these X number of things. I think so. I think that it's really key in understanding like what your hypotheses are, what your guesses are about why the business will succeed or about why it will fail. I think it's really you know important to actually like write those things out. Um, and kind of break it down. I think as far as like buckets of information uh, that people need to get out of an interview is like, what do you believe is the customer's current processes for, you know, how they navigate solving the problem today? And then in your customer discovery, you go and just ask them like, okay, tell me your current processes. So you can kind of see what the customer's perception or like what their actual process is against what your perception of the process was. Um, Understand, you know, you have a hypothesis about what problems they have and then you need to go ask them what problems they have. Mm -hmm. You have your guess about, what happens when that problem doesn't get solved? Now you need to figure out what happens when that problem doesn't get solved. You need to understand their current solutions, why their current solutions suck, what their actual, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what their desired outcomes actually are from that. You know, so that's really just getting really digging deep into it and understand the customer's problem and need. But then also, like, after you get better and you have a better understanding of that, you can go into understanding, you know, what the customer's current budgets are and what they what they currently spend on trying to solve the problem. Understanding their decision making unit. So, like, who are the influencers in this, you know, kind of like ecosystem? Who are the people that would recommend a product like yours that they would look to for guidance? Like, oh, this person is an industry expert. This person, like, whatever they're doing, we're following. Um, who are the champions in an actual organization or a family or, you know, whatever kind of relationship would influence somebody to adopt a new solution? Uh, who are the saboteurs? Whose mm. job could you possibly be eliminating that would not like what you're doing? Whose mm. job are you making harder? You need to be mindful of who all those, you know, players are. And it goes on, like, mm-hmm. you know, understanding what are the current methods for finding out about solutions. You know, you might be trying to market to them on social media but they actually all get this magazine from sports entertainment and Mm -hmm. that's where they look to to see 
like what's the best new I don't know sensor <laughs> right sensor yes, for your sensor. shoe <laughs> yes and so like it's, it, it all comes back to like you really need to understand directly from your customers and not just one or two but like try to talk to 200 of them and mm. figure out the answers to all those things and you'll have a more informed decision about what's the best way to solve the problem what's the best way to get it to them what's the price point that they you know would be willing to pay for it and all of that by just listening to people and not having you have your own assumptions but also go mm. in and challenge them and test them so i think those are like the major things to you know, really yeah. try to glean from an interview. You you totally sound like a scientist. You are, you are, no, no, seriously. It's, Creative scientist. Yeah, very, cr- yes. like, but For I think, sure. you know, um, that's that scientific approach. You know, you have an idea, but you're willing to let somebody tear that idea down, essentially, so yeah. that you can build a better one. And I feel like so many people get really, really attached to their their dream and there's nothing or their idea and there's nothing I guess wrong with that unless nobody else shares that <laughs> yeah so you have to kind of like be be willing to scientifically deconstruct the box yeah yes deconstruct yes the box. yeah and to build it to build it back up and build yeah. something more like you know, go build the Taj Mahal now. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, what are, I guess, are there, can you recommend any tools or resources that people use in the customer discovery process? I have a couple actually that, cause we're going through some customer discovery, but what do you recommend? You know, I was thinking about the difference between tools and best practices. Mm-hmm. And so for, yep. for me, I, I would say tools would be take another person with you when you mm-hmm. go do customer interviewing. Mm-hmm. Cause then you get to focus on the question questions are really being present in that, you know, conversation. Mm -hmm. And then they can focus on taking the notes and uh, really trying to gather all Mm -hmm. of the information. And even like when you're in the interview, there's only you you, you have limited attention, your, you know, attention modalities, like you're using like the same ones to try to like conduct the the interview and record it. And Mm -hmm. so I think having someone there and then also like what you think you might be the takeaways or what you heard, the other person might have a different perspective on that and Mm. so I think that like using another human you know Mm. as a tool um can be good in interviews actually asking you know people to record it well actually in the state of Ohio you don't need the other person's permission actually to record it as long as one per as long as one party has permission um Mm. which is you Um, Mm -hmm. and you're not using it to like she you're just using it to go back and take your own you know notes on it so you don't miss anything and you can actually do it um, I also think uh, another tool is having a paper like with your, you know, hypotheses at the top if you want to. But more importantly, having the strategic questions there because you can have these ideas. These are the questions I'm going to ask. And then when you go into it, you just mm-hmm. start having a conversation. And you're not really testing your hypotheses or, mm-hmm. or learning more about them. So I was going to say, like, I think it would be really easy to mix up your like if you're not asking everybody the same questions, you might be drawing yes. some wrong conclusions. I was just thinking like yes yes you're tainting the data Mm -hmm. and so you need to like keep some integrity you know Mm -hmm. there by actually asking the same questions and then having a section at the bottom of the paper that you use to you know write those answers of the questions like immediately after going back and say okay based on what they told me like what are my key takeaways? Did they confirm or deny or validate or invalidate what my initial belief or or guess was? So I think that as far as like tools or resources actually going into an interview, that that's what I, I recommend as a tool or a resource. But I'm curious, like, what what about you? You said you had... Yeah, and actually you kind of hit on it, which was um, sometimes I, I, we can't, I can't always have a second human in the, in the yeah. interview. It's just not, you know, not feasible with schedules or whatever. And that second human would normally be, you know, Annalisa, if we're like, you know, think, you know, doing this customer discovery process. But so I use a transcription, a yeah. record and transcribe service, which we have been through because we're because of podcasting actually podcasting. we have mm-hmm. been through uh, we've tested a lot of different ones many of them are really lacking in in, yeah. the, in the transcription area the ai you know the ai just isn't there but i we've had actually really good luck with otter i say that very carefully because it sounds 
O-T-T-E-R dot A-I. Um, and that's, um, of all the ones that we've tried, it's our favorite. And actually, our, our podcast producer recommended it. And uh, I, I think it was, a, it was a great recommendation. So that's the one I take it in to the customer discovery interview. And I always ask, like, uh, you know, I'm not going to be. Now you know you don't have to. Well, no. <laughs> I'm still going to ask. I'm still going to ask because, I, you know, I don't want the person feeling uncomfortable oh, right about kidding. about what we're doing and I always explain it's just so I can listen and talk with you and have a conversation without worrying about taking notes I know that that this is gonna mm-hmm. transcribe pretty accurately and and we can just talk and have a and have a good conversation so and it's done it's it's been great. I, I have loved it. Now, of course, there's still the process of going back and gleaning the nuggets, so to speak, from, yep. like you said, taking a, what your takeaways from each conversation. But it's it's been really helpful. Uh, Otter has. Um, and I want to ask you something, too, about about the customer discovery process. Obviously, you've mentioned multiple, you know, testing multiple hypotheses. Have you found that there's value and benefit to like question you know having a discovery process that's like almost a quick something that somebody could answer online in like five minutes versus a more in-depth conversational type of discovery and are there benefits are there and are there benefits to both so that's a good question as a champion of customer discovery i am against the the survey method because Mm -hmm. You know, I, was, I don't even remember exactly what the percentages are, but like not what 93% of communication has nothing to do with the actual words that mm-hmm. are said. It's, mm-hmm. you know, a, a significant portion of it is the nonverbal mm-hmm. um, stuff. And then I think, was it like 67, 70% is nonverbal? And then the other verbal piece is tone, which mm-hmm. has nothing to do with the words either. Right. And so... I think that there is a lot of information that you can get just from, you know, body language. Like for me, I like tune into those things, just knowing like, you know, somebody's talking to you and they're leaning one way or maybe they're, you know, tapping their fingers. Like all of that is giving you information about like what's going on or what their real response is or somebody tells you yes but they're shaking their head no. (laughs) Maybe they really need no. But, you know, and so. I think that there's so many little cues and stuff that you get from actually being able to see a a person. I do think that there is value in in surveys, but not as like the main method that you're Mm. trying to get information from. I think that if you do an interview and maybe there's some some follow up questions that you have that could be like a survey type of method, like on a scale of one to 10 or can you prioritize this or which thing is more intense for you? Which problem is more intense? Like you can get information like that or maybe, you know, you act, tell everyone at the end of your interview, hey, um, is it OK if I send you some, you know, follow up questions if mm. some comes to mind or, or something like that? Or but I w- wouldn't use it as the sole method of mm-hmm. getting information. I would use it as something that is uh, what's the word I supplemental. supplemental. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So oh, okay. either to an interview or even if you've done a, a chunk of like in-person interviews, you can use, you know, the survey method if you want to like take your interviews maybe from 100 or 200 to 500 or something to see what differences, you know, and in information mm. you might be able to get as well. But I wouldn't use it as like a primary mm. customer discovery tool. Oh, good. OK. Well, yeah, I was, I was thinking uh, going back to like tools and resources. I know for us in data names, like we've used customer service teams and sales teams Mm -hmm. to get some of our information that they're talking to you know they're talking to clients or potential clients and they're interviewing like what questions are you hearing or what you know what things are you hearing or what are people telling you Mm -hmm. great I mean that's a great point because yeah a lot of times when we're consulting as as marketers it's very hard for us to get direct access to our clients customers that's right. you know we're we're a little bit removed but when we can get the sales and customer service teams into the same room which most of the time they're they're fairly open to doing that then we can collect all kinds of information about you know what they're hearing as a result of all of their customer contact for marketers out there it's you know your sales and customer service folks are a a rich source of information for oh, messaging yeah. so much so they know what the problems <laughs> are for sure they do well and if they don't 
that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. I wish there were a tool. I mean, other than, so what we've used is when we do an interview with a, with a potential customer, you know, asking them at the end, like, do you know anyone else mm-hmm. that we could interview? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I wish there were a tool because t- sometimes that's the hardest part is like coming up with, okay, who do we, mm-hmm. who do we need to talk to? Um, mm-hmm. And how do we, how do we reach out to these? Like, how do we find them? And then how do we get a hold of them? Yeah. Good point. Yeah, that was, so I had like that answer under like best practices. Mm. And I, I imagine it probably depends on the audience how, how difficult that is. Yeah, I think that like there are, you know, a, a couple of, of, of things. So I think Steve Blanks, which is they what they call like the grandfather of the lean startup um, mm-hmm. method. If you can like research any tools or programs that cater to his uh, teaching, which um, the National Science Foundation mm-hmm. does adapt, like uh, adopt his curriculum uh, for uh, startups and customer discovery um, mm-hmm. through their i program. Mm-hmm. Tech stars. If you go on YouTube, they have a video about customer discovery. I believe the video is like six or seven minutes long, but they give you kind of like a format for which to ask like mm-hmm. very like high level questions. I, I like that. Definitely recommend people to research their kind of like startup scene or small business scene in, in their city to figure out who and the region might be helping uh, people really understand their customers more. Um, but then as far as like actually conducting the, the, the interviews, like looking for kind of like any conferences or trade shows around, you know, what it is that you're trying to do or tackle, even if actually going to them, but also looking at the pamphlets and seeing who was there. You know, if you're, mm. um, you know, it, maybe it's about oh, people who, idea. you know, manage apartments. You can see who are mm-hmm. some of the biggest apartment owners or something like that in the land. And, you know, a, a lot of times they'll have their contact um, information there, you know, like reach out to them. Um, awesome. I think another one is looking at any journals or public, like who's talking about this right now? Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can, can reach out, reach out to them. Um, always at the end of the interview asking like, who else? Do you, is there anybody else that you recommend that I talk to? But even before that asking, is there anything that you feel like I should have asked but mm-hmm. didn't or anything mm-hmm. else that you like to share? Because there mm-hmm. might just be something that you're completely um, missing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then you kind of alluded to it um, beforehand, like when you said like you're going directly to like the customer to serv- service departments and asking them what they're hearing. See, maybe if there's a, a similar watering hole like that mm-hmm. um, in, in your industry. So maybe you are talking to people who have diabetes. Mm-hmm. Well, what would it look like to get insight from someone who actually is the doctor of people who have diabetes? They can mm-hmm. give you like so much insight. So is there someone that, you know, people, a lot of people go to um, that is your actual, in co- your, your target customer end user, but, you know, might meet with or engage with a lot of people that are your end user or, or target customer? It's not, yeah, then, it sounds like a great way to get, you know, various perspectives. Mm-hmm. Well, for sure, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And, you know, and they could, they have like insight beyond, mm-hmm. you know, they have yeah. even the outliers, you yeah. know, they know information about them. Mm. Uh, fishing where the fish are. So if you have like a hair product per se, and you're trying to like design it or whatever, like would it hurt for you to go to Target and hang out near their hair product session, section and just observe people? Right. Like just not yeah, even, no, not even ask, sure. but see like right. what they're doing, like yeah. how they're navigating their decision-making and what's mm. their behavior like? What, you know, items do they put in their cart and take out? Mm-hmm. How are they paying? Are they paying with cash or credit? Are they using coupons or are they, when they're actually shopping, are they looking at their phone and then going back to the shelf and looking again or looking at their phone? That's like, you know, like what is actually influencing their decision making. And then you can like talk to them. Hey, I noticed that you were checking out something. <laughs> hey, can I'm not too creepy. <laughs> yeah, <Right>? be, be <laughs> a, a best practice, be a creep. Like <laughs> yeah. that's a that's a that's a best I love it. Practice. Wow. Like, I'm gonna so, I'm gonna frame that. No, yes. just kidding. <laughs> be, no, do it. Go for yeah. it. Be a creep. <laughs> be a creep. Maybe and, then, sure. and then and then and the people will ask you, what does that mean? Or maybe like, they'll just just walk out of your house. Right. Uh, of- um, yeah, they're like, <laughs> I am running but, out of here. 
I think, you know, those are probably, you know, a couple of, you know, best practices that I would recommend, like actually observing, asking people, talking to people after you observe them, um, and, uh, and then going through the process yourself. That's the best practice. So that begs the question, like, when is the cr- customer discovery process finished? Is it ever finished? Like, I, I feel like it's yeah. it's kind of kind of just an ongoing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, with we, we talk about MVP, minimal viable product, like yeah. and and you start there and you iterate. So I feel like, yeah, the customer discovery process is just like ongoing. Right. Yeah. Oh, we, yes. oh, we got and, her excited. <laughs> um, yeah, it's because at the beginning of the conversation, mm-hmm. you were talking about, you know, marketing and how it's just so many different, you know, facets of it. And there's always stuff to learn. Like you started out the conversation saying like you're always learning. Yeah. And so I think that that is so key. Even like like an example is with the, the K-Cups, um, with mm. the coffee. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Keurig decided, I, I think it was Keurig, maybe it was a different company. Um, but they decided, okay, like this coffee Keurig thing is like, you know, like people are loving it. And so mm-hmm. they decided that they were going to invest these millions of dollars into like a cold cup. Keurig so you can make like cold you know Mm, uh, like iced tea you know iced tea and stuff and they spent all these millions of dollars to figure out the market did not respond how they thought Mm. they would and so perhaps maybe if they did a little bit more customer discovery or something they would find that out and so I do think you know as you continue to grow and expand you're always going to need to be listening to your customers Mm -hmm. and even if Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. that's how you if you if you're not innovating and putting back money into research and development like you are going to die you cannot Mm, resist the fact that change is always going to be happening your customers mindsets is going to change the experience and what's available to them is going to change and so you need to be you know on top of what that change is for the like what's becoming meaningful to them now going back into the meaningful marketing piece yeah like yeah even like one of my also one of my favorite stories i can go on and on there was a what do you call it? A uh, martial arts studio. And like their marketing was all about like, we're going to make the next black belt and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then like, if that's like how you, you know, fit all your marketing. And then when you talk to people, they're like, yo, I came here with my friends for a fun way to work out. Yeah. Like, right. I just, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to have fun and this was different. And it's like, imagine that, you know, you change your whole messaging oh. and your whole business around, yeah. You know, you want a fun new way to, you know, work out versus become the next Jedi yeah. black belt, yeah. right? <laughs> and so, I feel, yeah, that's like, probably such a small segment of people who actually, like you said, want to become the next Jedi black belt. But mm-hmm. far more people are like, hey, I, I just want to, I want to get in better shape. And I'd also like to maybe learn to defend myself or whatever. You yeah. know, what I mean, there might be like just some different angles, but way, way more toned down. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, I guess that leads to like biggest mistakes, I guess, as we kind of conclude this, this conversation about customer discovery, what, what are the biggest mistakes you've seen and that you can give people a heads up to avoid when they're doing customer discovery? So this is really hard. Like even, <laughs> you know, as you know, myself as someone who's helped, you know, and, and work with, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, I can, I know for a fact, that when you're in something and it's yours, it's it's harder, but to really get out of the way from trying to like validate your mm. your idea or having someone validate you really is really what it is. And so mm. people are people go into it and they really just want to be confirmed. Mm-hmm. And it's like you're not you shouldn't uh. go into it to be confirmed um there's this uh, clip that we show at my old job and it's a dumb and dumber and uh, <laughs> i remember that movie <laughs> yes and he's like so like do you think that you know we you know have a chance and she's like e- <laughs> there were you know only a million people on the planet maybe there's like a one in a million chance or she said something like that mm-hmm. and he's like or she's like, no, not one in a billion. And he's like, so you're telling me there's a chance. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so, it's like, and so like, I think that, you know, as an entrepreneur, that's like a big mistake people make is like, they just hold on to that one thing they wanted to hear. And it's like, you're not, you, you need yeah. to take that back into context of what's really yeah. going on. 
And so I think that that's like a, a, a huge mistake is, you know, not really listening. So mm. there is like this, um, it was like, a, I think it was a podcast or interview or something I was listening to with Steve Blanks, actually. Mm. And he's saying that they found that there's a direct correlation to uh, an entrepreneur's passion and their failure. And you would think that mm. it would be the opposite, that oh. the more passionate people would be least likely to fail and it's mm. because the most passionate people are just so stuck on their idea and it's the best thing since sliced bread mm. and they're not willing to actually be wrong and go and test those you know beliefs that they have you know about why they'll be successful and so mm. I think you know passion is a good thing but you also have to be open to like really understanding your your he who knows their customer best wins and so you really have to get out of the way and really listen you know, to people. So, um, you're, so, so that, that was saying essentially that people who are passionate actually might fail at their, at their business. Uh, idea. Yeah. Okay. They're not actually, they're just so gung ho about it. You need to actually go and listen. And I think the, the other mistake people made is like being in, in sales mode. Like you're trying to, you know, win people mm-hmm, over mm-hmm. and get them to, you know, buy their product or or whatever. And it's like, you shouldn't be in sales mode. You should really just be trying to understand your customer. It's not, it's it's a difference between customer discovery and and selling. And I think that some people don't differentiate the two. And so I think that that's a big mistake that people make. I feel like that's a perfect circle back to the empathy piece because like, yeah, I mean, Again, going back to like what we what we usually hear sales to be or think of sales to be is like, yeah, just sell, the, you know, sell the product or service and be passionate about it. Right. Is mm-hmm. it it's because like those things are what, what's <laughs> sexy, like, you know, yeah. the success, yeah. like if we just talk about success. Right. And like having passion and 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 making sales like mm-hmm. that's what's yeah. sexy. But in reality, yeah. it's like the in the trenches is like really what it's all about. Yeah. And nobody, yeah. And, and I don't think that the business, well, I mean, good business coaches certainly will talk about that, but sure. you know, the people who are like, you know, posting on LinkedIn. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're right. They don't exactly <laughs> like, yeah, this, this idea that it's not quite, uh, not quite that easy. And, and yeah, agree. Well, I'm going to make sure that we have all of these resources that have been mentioned in, in the podcast, I'll link them in the show notes and, Ebony, if you like, um, you you like did a, some quotes from the book uh, right at the beginning of this segment about mm-hmm. customer discovery definition. If you could like send me that info, I want to make sure like that book gets um, included in this um, in the show cool. notes. Yeah, cool. So, yep, the startup owner's manual. That's oh. what it's called. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll make I will sh- send it to you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, we will now like talk a little bit about small businesses we like to give like I know we love to we're a small business and we love to give other small businesses a shout out so is there anyone in the Akron area that we everybody should know about that's a great small business if you if you tell me one um there is a lady that um I just you know recently um met and become acquainted with and it's an essential business, really, because mm. everybody has a car and they need their car service. And so there, it's a family owned business, a family owned, black owned family owned mm. business. And she's awesome. actually take she's taking it over mm-hmm. and it's called So Fresh Used Auto. That's they, a that's a different name for <laughs> for used cars, for sure. Yeah. So I think it started off, I think she said, like as a car wash mm. and then they evolved into it. So they, they kept it the, kept the same name. Mm. Um, but mm. if mm. you like need your oil change or need to get your brakes done or, you know, mm. stuff like that, she's now leading it. And I just think it's so phenomenal. Awesome. that She's like a mechanic. I think um, that is I mean, that is awesome. Mm. Um, and, you know, as two women who have you know, tried to, and you also even doing engineering, um, those are often so such male dominated industries, I would think, yeah, car Mm -hmm. repair is, I, I, yeah, the number of of women I've ever heard in that field, I think she might be one, I don't think I've ever seen a woman in that industry. So that's awesome. Good for her. For sure. For for sure. So what's it called again? One more time. So fresh use auto. Okay. I believe, I believe that's what it's called. And do they sell cars as well? I think so. Okay. 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 
All right. Well, she must be. Well, I mean, used cars are like I was listening to a podcast. They're a commodity other, right now. Yeah, they're a hot. Yeah, they are a hot commodity. Really? Like, yeah, like they went up from April to May um, in the consumer price index, 10 percent. Like that's. Oh, wow. That is like something that never happens. I guess it's. Oh, wow. it's, it's just never happened before that used cars would be up that much. And I don't know, like a lot of factors that are. Yeah, you know, of course. I mean, we only have a pandemic once every hundred years, right? Hundred years, yeah, years, and and cars Let's really hope, weren't right. And, Knock on wood, right? Yeah, right. Hopefully, and there, you know, I need to be preparing the future generation, like my future yeah. generation. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, think about it. I mean, in 1918, I mean, how many people actually had cars in 1918? So, you know, who would know like, oh, used cars really went up post the Spanish flu. Oh, wait. Okay. (laughs) So who knows what the world will be like? I I hope. Yeah. I hope, like you said, it's only every hundred years or maybe 200 would be good or never. How about never (laughs) again? Can we make these huge mistakes? I know it's coming. It's coming. (laughs) I know. I know. I know. Um, so finally we get to our favorite part, which we always like to talk about. What are we drinking? It's just because Annalisa and I are such a huge fan of beverages in general. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. um, you go first. What, is there something, <clears throat> excuse me, is there something that you're drinking that's a, a new favorite or an old favorite? It's, it's a, can you hear me swirling my, yes. my feet yeah. earlier. <laughs> um, so I really, like, I am a huge ginger fan. Like, I love yeah. ginger, like real ginger. I love it. So any drink with ginger, I'm a fan. So the what I'm drinking now is a combination of a peach tea and then I add, like, fresh mints ginger in it and like coconut oh, sugar wow. and it's okay. just like so good like peach and ginger go together and i actually stole this idea from there's a um a small business in in akron oh, i should know one. the name i don't know the name of it but i seen her at a couple of markets and it mm. hurt I can, my tea doesn't compare it to hers. It's like phenomenal. It's like a peach ginger. I don't mm. have to figure out where her business is. Yeah, yeah, send, send us that. Us that. We yeah, can, send we us that. Add we'll add it. We'll add it to yes, the show notes. I will. And then drinks. Um, there is the the Speakeasy at Northside in in Akron, oh. and I believe I believe the drink. Maybe it's called the penicillin. I don't know. Oh, um, but, <laughs> that sounds uh, intense. <laughs> Which I'm actually allergic to amoxicillin, so I think oh. that that makes me automatically <laughs> allergic to penicillin. Penicillin, actually, but um, <laughs> mm. but I like the drink. So the drink like, thank <laughs> God, it has nothing to do with actual mm. penicillin, right? <laughs> no, it's got to do with lots of ginger. I think that's Ooh. the ginger drink. I could be wrong, but I just love ginger. So anything with ginger. Maybe that name just comes from talking about pandemics, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like some kind of like connection. Um, I don't, I was going to say, Annalisa, you're you're a huge uh, ginger. Oh yeah, I lover. Love ginger. Gin and ginger. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Do you do gin and ginger? <laughs> I don't like gin. Oh so. no. Okay. Right. okay well, that's, that's that's no. Is there an alternative? I mean, you could do. Uh, well, I've done bourbon mm-hmm. and ginger. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's yeah. very yeah. good. It's very the, good. Those go. They, they go good together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we have like what's the ginger beer? Like you're very particular. Q. Yeah. Q. Q. Q She's ginger beer. super particular and, and where do you even get like Q is not in the pop aisle you can yeah, tell I'm from I mean, Ohio I'm saying pop yeah. not in the soda aisle <laughs> I mean I found oh. it in Giant Eagle okay so is it is it okay, by the, Q. Yeah, yeah but yeah it's they come in like small cans they're yeah, not they're like it's cans. not meant to really it's really more of a mix I don't know I guess a, another brand that's probably more well known is like fever tree okay yes and i okay. love that yeah yeah okay. and they're really good but you you would probably find q where you would find fever tree okay all right all right so i'll have to so, try q then yeah I'll see what you, q. you have to let yes. us you have to let us know if you're like oh i'm a fever tree fan or yeah. i'm a q fan so look i will let you know on sunday you can post about it on linkedin but maybe not <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're having drinks too, guys. Right. So, I know. Yeah, Nobody, yeah. Everybody's so buttoned. Everybody well, needs a drink. I was to say, I think people are a little less buttoned up now than than they LinkedIn used to be. Like, I think pre-pandemic was like, oh my goodness, let's not admit that we drink or that we like. It's so boring. I know, like, I it's so boring. I know. Um, so we we recently had a trip to Pittsburgh. My daughter was celebrating her. 21st birthday. I have a 21 year old daughter now, which blows my mind, but, um, (laughs) she, she wanted some, uh, 
what do I want to say, advice from the elder statesmen on what really <clears throat> good uh, places to, you know, really good drinks and, and vibe. Yeah. She wanted to imbibe properly. <laughs> so she asked us to take her to Pittsburgh. So <clears throat> we should talk a little bit about some, uh, a couple of the places that were outstanding, yeah. like Arsenal, uh, Arsenal Cider. Yeah. Wow. They have a couple locations in Pittsburgh yeah. and they just opened a, a location in Ohio City. So yeah. there's now one in in Ohio. Oh, hey. All right. Well, we can all go to Arsenal. Cleveland. Cider. So they have an um, amazing ginger yeah, cider. There you go. You, I, yeah, you, it's, so it's all hard cider, obviously. Right. And it's, believe me, if you're thinking of, of Mike's hard or whatever, like Angry Orchard, just put those thoughts out of your yeah. mind. No comparison to that kind yeah. of mass market right. cider. Um, very craft cider and they have this amazing ginger one that i was like wow so you would probably love it <laughs> okay i will i yep. will uh i will try it because i will be sunday uh oh one of my friends has a uh like a apartment or whatever downtown cleveland oh, nice. so we're gonna go on the rooftop and have some drinks and yes. so maybe i can pick up some yeah. cider yeah. yes although yeah. i don't i don't like beer though the cider is the only like beers i can handle so yeah. well perfect yeah then yeah. you then yeah the yeah. cider is is a good choice and yeah. the other cidery that we is it a cidery do they call it that a I cider so. place Maybe. i don't know <laughs> brewery yeah. cidery is threadbare mm -hmm. threadbare. yeah and their sister company which actually they were they were incepted first incepted is that even a word i don't anyway right. Right, they, they conceived. Oh, that yeah, sounds bad too. Uh, yeah. So, uh, was is Weigel or Weigel or they call it Wiggle, which is it's, so weird. It's Come on, W I G L E. Yeah, um, yeah. Why would okay. you think? Why would you think a word W I G L E would be and pronounced they Wiggle? I have no idea. With unaged like whiskey, so clear clear whiskey never been put in a barrel to age, mm. and that was gosh probably I, I grew up near Pittsburgh so. Um, that okay. was probably 10 years ago or so that they started. And then they've just like exploded. They have like every kind of liquor. They've got like, um, yeah, like liqueurs, like, uh, yeah. limoncello. Mm -hmm. um, and they had another, I was trying to think of the other, um, rhubarb. Yeah. They, they rhubarb, make like a rhubarb yeah. liqueur now. They have like an Amaro. Very good. Yeah. So. They're very good. Um, the only yeah. thing okay. I would say, the only place I would say in Ohio that we've tried that I would say is on par with uh weigel and we've mentioned them before on the podcast and that's western reserve distillery in cleveland they yeah. are also and they, they have a couple mm -hmm. um different liquors but they they don't have quite the selection that right weigel they're just starting has. out they're yeah. they're new to i think they're a fairly new yep. distillery but what they have made is is really exceptional so um yeah so for ohioans looking for not feeling like going all the way to pittsburgh for mm -hmm. Weigel wiggle all the way it's not that far <laughs> right uh not that far. <laughs> yeah um so anyway that's our that yeah. those are our our bevies of choice recently so sweet well thanks ebony yes for, thanks so much you have been an amazing interviewee and i have learned even Absolutely. yeah i've definitely learned from 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 you and from talking with you you have. I hope you'll come back thanks ebony That'd be great yeah. all right yeah. thanks so much thank you that wraps up another episode of Meaningful, Measurable Marketing. If you manage marketing, sales, customer service, or operations for a growing small business, we hope you found this podcast helpful. Any tool, resource, or article we reference can be found in the show notes for this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed to our podcast or left us a review, we hope you'll do both today. I'm Jen Carroll. My co-host, Annalisa Hilliard, and I are marketing strategy consultants, and together we are the Data Dames of Data Dames Marketing. Learn more about us at datadamesmarketing.com.